Good morning, everyone. I am Alnet Lee Tan, New Sigma Phi Sorority Batch 1992, speaking in behalf of the Aging and Longevity Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority. We are streaming live from the video conference room of the UP Manila Information Management Service. Our time in Manila is now exactly 12 o'clock noon. We have a total of 550 registered to this webinar from all over the Philippines, from Batak, Ilocos Norte to Tawi-Tawi, and also we have um, from around the world, from around 10 countries, from USA, for as far north as Sweden, Bahrain, the Maldives, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, New Zealand, Japan, and also on a cruise ship. Uh, in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> Hello to all of you out there and thanks for tuning in. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and will deliver interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. Today's webinar was awarded 10 PMA CME units for medical doctors, and two CPD units for nurses. CPD units for physicians and pharmacists are still pending. For today's webinar, we are privileged to have a distinguished alumna of the UP College of Medicine as our speaker, Dr. Mingita Padilla. She is a graduate of the UP College of Medicine class 1985. She finished her ophthalmology training and is currently a clinical associate professor at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the UP College of Medicine. She completed her fellowship in cornea and eye banking in Baltimore, Maryland, and Prague. She is the founder of the Eye Bank Foundation of the Philippines and is a multi-awarded physician for her work in series. She was awarded, um, she was awarded Hero for Health in 2004 a Centennial Award in 2005, Prevention of Blindness Award from the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology in 2009, and was the Jose Rizal Memorial Lecture Awardee in 2017. She became the head executive staff for PhilHealth and fought against fraud and improvement of the situation with PhilHealth in the country. Dr. Padilla is currently an active consultant at the St. Luke's Medical Center Global City where she's the head of the ocular tissue transplant service. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Mingita Padilla. Thank you, Alnet, and um, thank you to New Sigma Phi Sorority for the honor of making me one of the lecturers for this year uh, long webinar series. I heard I only have 30 minutes, so I better get started. And I want to say hello to everybody watching. Aging and eyes. The eyelids in the eyes are among the tissues most affected by aging. You have eye bags, you have drooping eyelids, you have cataracts, age-related degeneration of the retina, drug among the most common diseases we encounter. Even in not the aging population, about 5 to 50 percent of people around the world have dry eye. In some countries, it's even more than others. But as you get older, it becomes more prevalent. It is also higher in women than in men. The prevalence is higher in Asian than Western populations, and it can range from mild to debilitating uh, conditions, and the economic burden and impact of dry eye on quality of life and productivity is significant. Now, the outline of our lecture is this. We will try to define eye, dry eye disease. What causes dry eye disease? What happens? How do you diagnose it? What are the types of dry eye, and what are the treatment options? I was told our audience I should speak to non-ophthalmologists, to nurses, to pharmacists, and to the lay people. So it's a challenge so that you don't get bored or think it's too highfalutin. I'll try to make it as, as interesting as possible. Now, we are very fortunate, we who are students of dry eye, that we have a tier four film ocular surface dry eye workshop. We just had the latest one in 2017 published in the journal Ocular Surface. This workshop, it's a collaboration of two years of 150 experts worldwide who examined available evidence on dry eye. So it's a meta-analysis 
in everything in it. No? The purpose of the workshop was to update the definition of dry eye, its classification, update what causes it, uh, the pathophysiology, the mechanisms, update recommendations on how you diagnose and treat dry eye, and recommend designs for future trials. A lot of what I will discuss this afternoon is actually based on the dues to report. What is dry eye disease? Now, this is the definition of the dues to. And we can go through it. We will understand this more as we go along. Dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface, characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film. So it's made, it's caused by many things. Lack of homeostasis or losses, loss of balance or equilibrium of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms, which we will enumerate later, in which tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, inflammation and damage, and neurosensory abnormalities play an etiological role or play etiological roles. It may sound so highfalutin, but as we go along, we'll realize it's not that difficult to understand. What happens in dry eye? To understand dry eye, we first have to understand what a normal tear film is. Now, the normal tear film is one of the greatest creations of God. It is so perfect. It acts in all ways you need to see well and to be comfortable. It forms the first refractory surface of light entering the eye. In other words, you have to have a smooth tear film so that you can see properly. It protects and moisturizes the cornea. The old three-layer model of um, the tears is no longer really what we use today, but we'll go to that later. The tear, the lipid layer is um, produced mainly by the meibomian glands, which are the oil glands in the eyelids. The acus is produced mainly by the lacrimal glands, although there are accessory lacrimal glands, and the goblin cells produce the mucine. But now we think of the tear film more as a biphasic thing. No? The outer layer, which is lipid, is mostly wax and cholesterol esters. It's the fat, and it protects the eye against evaporation and it's spread over the mucoaqueous layer. The mucoaqueous layer is a mixture of mucin and the aqueous. There are four types of mucin and over 1,500 proteins and peptides in this layer. These proteins and peptides are lubricants, nutrients, antimicrobials that fight bacteria, proteins, electrolytes, anti-inflammatories, growth factors. So it's really a great combination of things to keep our eyes healthy and to protect us. The interaction of this entire film prevents evaporation, prevents our tears from spilling, and promotes stability of the tears. And it is only three micrometers thick, but everything is there. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you have a normal tear film, you don't need any eye drops because your tears are perfect. However, when in dry eye disease, what happens? Anything that disrupts this perfect balance of the tear film can cause hyperosmolarity, wherein there are so many solutes floating around the tears, more than normal. And this triggers a cascade of events, which we call the vicious cycle of dry eye disease. Now, what can disrupt homeostasis? So many things. It's multifactorial. You have nephritis or the inflammation of the eyelids. You have eyelid irregularities, topical medicines that have preservatives, allergies, contact lenses. Although contact lenses can be used also to treat dry eye, they can also cause dry eye. Then you have the environment, extremely dry, too much computer use without enough blinking, viral infections, bacterial infections, neurotrophic because of nerve problems. Sometimes refractive surgery can also cause uh, simulate dry eye. Then you have ocular surgery of any kind, even cataract surgery, any surgery that disrupts the balance of the eyes. Then you have systemic drugs, we will enumerate them later. So many drugs can cause dry eye. Then you have Sjogren syndrome or other autoimmune diseases, sex, steroid, or hormonal imbalance, very important in the aging population. All of this, if you have this, it can cause tear film instability, which will cause the, drop, the eyes or the tears to evaporate fast. Then you have hyperosmolarity. Then you have cell death. So when the cells die, they again cause more inflammation, which again, causes more damage to the eye. So if you do not stop this cycle, it just goes on and on and on. Then you have a very bad dry eye disease. So the treatment of dry eye aims to break this vicious cycle to prevent the hyperosmolarity from happening and inflammation. So to bring about relief of signs and symptoms. So this cycle is very important. We try to break it when we tell you uh, to treat it, how to treat it. 
So first you have to assess, do you have the symptoms of dry eye? Is it mild, moderate, severe? What kind of dry eye is it? Is it a deficiency of the aqueous? Is it evaporation? Is it combined, which happens in most, if not all, I mean, most dry eye rather. And what are the causes? Are there any risks? We have eyelid abnormalities, systemic conditions, medication, environment. Now, this is a diagram of, it's like the steps you, you, you go through when you diagnose dry eye. First, we ask questions. Triaging questions to say, is this dry eye or is it something else? We assess, assess the risk factors. Once we feel it is dry eye, we look at the diagnosis, we look at the eye itself, we look at the signs. Then we decide, is this evaporative? Is this aqueous? How bad is it? That's how we decide how to treat you. Now, not all clinicians will use the ocular surface disease index. It's a formal questionnaire to ask the patient to fill up to help us assess if you have the symptoms of dry eye and how bad it is. There's also a shorter one with a dry eye questionnaire with five questions. But even if your doctor does not have these questionnaires, they ask you questions, and these questions are important. To those watching out there who might think they have dry eye, these are the questions you have to ask yourself, and we ask you, are your eyes sensitive to light? Do you experience grittiness of the eyes? Magalas, may puing. Are your eyes sore, masakit mahapdi, and frequently red? Do you have blurred vision or poor vision? Sometimes when you watch TV for a long time, your eyes get blurred. Or when you read for a long time, your eyes start to get blurred. Or driving for that matter. Is your vision made better by blinking? If you say yes, most likely you have dry eyes. Do your symptoms limit your activities in any way, like driving, computer, TV, work, reading? Are your symptoms made worse by windy conditions, electric fan, air con, or places with low humidity? Then we also ask you, do these symptoms happen all the time, most of the time, half of the time, sometimes, or not at all? By just answering these questions, we will be able to assess, do you have symptoms of dry eye and how bad are they? Then are there risk factors? Aging and menopause, because of the imbalance of the sex hormones, the lid abnormalities, decrease in androgens, etc. We will talk about this more later. Then systemic medications. Is the patient on medicines? So many medicines can cause dry eye. You have your beta blockers for hypertension. A lot of um, um, medicines that act on the nervous system also cause dry eye. You have antidepressants, diuretics, anxiolytics, antipsychotics, anti-Parkinson drugs, isotretinoin. That's why some teenagers who are in acne treatment develop dry eye. Estrogen therapy. This is also one reason why some women on hormonal replacement therapy can actually experience a worsening of the dry eye symptoms. Antihistamine, systemic chemotherapy. What about topical medicines? Anti-glaucoma drops such as stimulol, betaxolol, uh, the prostaglandins, even brimomidine can cause dry eye. The preservatives in the eye drops can cause dry eye. Decongestants that can make your eyes white when they're red, if abused, can also cause dry eye. Even smoking. Then environment and diet, computer vision syndrome. It's more because when we use the computer, especially computer games, and the smaller the device, we don't have complete blinks. It's not so much the number of blinks, but the completeness of the blink. Try to observe somebody playing a video game, and you'll see when they blink, it's not complete, and that can cause dry eye. Exposure to windy, dusty conditions, air conditioning, low humidity, a low fatty acid diet, low in, in oily fish, can also contribute, and not enough water. Drinking water is very important. Now, this is for non-ophthalmologists. If all symptoms point to dry eye disease, but the recommended treatment doesn't result in a marked improvement within a month, please refer to an ophthalmologist. Um, eye drops are very easily um, obtainable, even over the counter. That's fine, because most early dry eye will respond just to the eye drops. But sometimes it's not just that. So you must understand there are differential diagnoses that, that might present as dry eye, but they are not, and they have comorbidities or other diseases associated. Allergic conjunctivitis, atopic, vernal, GPC. You have viral conjunctivitis, bacterial conjunctivitis. They may have the same symptoms as dry eye, although sometimes in bacterial, it's just one eye and not two eyes. Anterior blepharitis or inflammation of the front of the eyelid on the margin. Demodex infestation. I'll talk about this more later because it happens more in the aging population and it becomes significant, especially in some populations. Parasitic infections like chlamydia, it can present as a chronic irritation of the eye, but usually only on one eye, whereas dry eye is both eyes. 
but this needs to be treated. It is also a sexually transmitted disease. Other differentials, you can have corneal abnormalities. You, have, you can have a bullous keratopathy, which can come after cataract surgery. Autoimmune conditions like Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE can present with dry eye. You must address the main problem. Graft versus host disease after bone marrow transplant. This is really can become quite serious and can be vision threatening. And those who are doing bone marrow transplants, or if you had a transplant, you may experience eye problems, you must see your ophthalmologist. Contact lenses is another risk factor and psychological factors. You know, I have patients who ask me, half jokingly, half not, Doctora, are my eyes dry because of crying over my bad husband? I said, no, your tears don't really get finished by crying, but the psychological factors brought about by your heart aches can contribute. Do you stay up late at night? Do you have insomnia? You're staring at the wall? Do you take antipsychotics or antidepressants? They will all lead to dry eye. So it's not because your eyes run out of tears per se, but psychological factors have to be considered. Now, you determine the patient has the symptoms. Now you have to see the signs. So we zero in on the signs. So if you are scoring with those tests I gave you, um, the dry eye questionnaire five of score of more than six or the OSI more than 13, but as I said, most clinicians do not use this. They just base it on their questions. You have to now go to the signs. You look at the eye. There are so many tests for dry eye, but the those two just zeroed in on some tests, which they feel are easily available meaning they can be done in the clinic. They are more objective. They have the ability to diagnose and not so much sensitive. It's more sensitive and specific than other tests. And there's minimal invasiveness. So it's easier to do and less toxic for the patient. And what tests are these? These are in order of least invasive to most invasive. You have the non-contact or non-invasive uh, tear breakup time. Then you have osmolarity, but not all centers have these. Only the real big centers will have these. The most, most ophthalmologists will have fluorescein. They can do the fluorescein breakup time, and they can do ocular staining with either fluorescein or lysamine green. So for the, just as a brief description of fluorescein, they come in strips. Usually you wet the strip with um, a little BSS, you shake it, and then you Put it on the, actually it should be the conjunctiva in the bulbar in this area, flat, so as not to damage the cornea or irritate the eye too much. And after about a minute, you ask the patient to blink three times, have them open the eye, and keep them open. The first black spot that comes out, you time it from the time they open the lid to the first black spot, and that's the tear breakup time. Um, the usual books will say 10 seconds. Less than 10 seconds means dry eye, but other studies will say, in the older population, it may be shorter, like seven seconds. Now, the Japanese, particularly Dr. Yokoi, they went a step further. So these are examples of tear breakup times, you see? So he blinks, and then the, there, there's a black, those are the lines, the tears are breaking up. That's another pattern, is the dot pattern. It's not <clears> enough now that they count the number of seconds, they look at the patterns of tear breakup, and they'll tell you what kind of, um, dry eye you have. But of course, this is beyond the scope of this lecture. Okay? We are still trying to study this as well. We can also use diets to stain the cornea. When you have moderate to severe dry eyes, your cornea will stain with fluorescein. You see these uh, dots here. And your conjunctiva will stain, especially with listening green. Uh, there are many uh, methods to assess the staining, but they're all based on the number, the location, and whether they're confluent or not. But this is also what your ophthalmologist uses why they put fluorescein in your eye, they make you blink, they look at you in the slit down with a blue light, okay? Now, we look at the eyelids. This is a normal eyelid. Meibomian gland dysfunction plays a very important role in causing dry eye disease, especially in the elderly population. This, you can see this whitish things, the glands, the oil glands of the eyelids are blocked, they're plugged. And because of that, the oils cannot come out normally and it causes the tears to evaporate faster than they should, then you have dry eye disease. Now, we'll go to that a little bit more later. I just wanna show you some of the toys or the more sophisticated machines we have. This test 
the osmolarity of the coin of the of the tear film and not all centers have this but it's great to have it you can actually do a very quantitative assessment of the osmolarity of the tears normal is about 302 mild to moderate and severe dry eye it also there's a difference between the two eyes of about eight milliosmols per liter it's also probably dry eye PGH has this. We have a mabomography. We can actually visualize the mabomian gland to see if there's any damage. And if you see that there is indeed a mabomian gland dysfunction or an evaporative type of dry eye. We also look at the level of the tears in the slit tap to see if there's any loss or decrease in the volume of the tears. So all of this your ophthalmologist can do, okay? Now, dry eye disease is more prevalent in the aging population because of the hormonal imbalance of estrogens and androgens. Androgens are very important. They actually bind the bimobian glands, which produce oil, and increase the oil production, and they increase keratinization. Keratinization will cause them to block. So it also protects the lacrimal gland. So androgen is friendly to the eyes, to the tears. Androgen deficiency is a risk factor for dry eye. There is a decrease in androgen when? In menopause, because of the decrease in ovarian and adrenal androgen secretion. So even women have androgen. And when we have menopause, we go into menopause, this goes down. Aging in both sexes, men and women, there's also a decrease in total androgen pool. That's why men who are young don't usually have dry eye problems. So when they get to an older age, then you have all these problems. The use of anti-androgen medication in those with prostatic hypertrophy in the elderly or prostatic cancer can cause dry eye. Women with dysfunctional androgen receptors and your autoimmune diseases, your lupus, your Sjogren's, your rheumatoid arthritis, all of these, the androgen levels decrease and it can cause dry eye. In contrast, estrogens and progesterones appear to decrease lipid production in the meibomian glands. This is why sometimes, as I said earlier, women who are on hormonal replacement treatment with progesterones and estrogens get worsening symptoms of dry eye. So the, it's all throughout this lecture, you will see balance, equilibrium, homeostasis, a balance is the key. So this is why aging, dry eye, more prevalent in aging population. I said earlier, we check the eyelids. These are examples of signs of eyelid infection. Sometimes you see frothy discharge. This tells you, this, this froth is like soap. They're byproducts of the fat breakup by um, the enzymes of the bacteria. So it's painful. It's like having soap in your eyes, literally. And we need to clean these eyelids. We will talk about uh, treatment later. And demodex infestation of the eyelids. I have to mention this in relation to aging because age, it seems as people age, there's a higher incidence of demodex, not only, not so much in the eyelids alone, but in the hairy parts of the skin. Um, some studies show as high as 84% of those 60 and above, and almost 100% of those 70 and above have demodex infestation. This is sad because it happens especially in elderly people who are not being cared for enough. Maybe they don't take a bath as often, their hygiene is not as good. Then you get these infections. They carry bacteria. They feed on the sebum or the oil of the eyelids, of the meibomian glands, of the hair follicles, and their waste products cause inflammation. Now, there are many treatments, uh, lid scrubs, uh, petrolatum, eye ointments, but a very special mention in the dues to report was made on tea tree oil. There are now tea tree oil wipes and tea tree oil shampoo. It has been found that a 50% uh, concentration of tea tree oil, even once, does a lot to remove the demodex, but that's kind of toxic to the eye. So they now have 25% uh, wipes and the shampoo, daily shampoo also helps. One dose of oral ivermectin, which is an antiparasitic, also helps, also helps remove it. Tea tree oil is antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, uh, it's anti-inflammatory, and it's toxic to demodex. I have no financial interest with any tea tree oil. Okay? It's just that it, 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 it made me feel good to see that they're now recognizing even essential oils and uh, complementary medicine in the new. Uh, this is uh, how it's, it's hard to imagine that we have this mite in our eyelashes. Um, we usually just pluck an eyelash and we can send it to the laboratory with a microscope. Now, other eyelid problems that may cause secondary dry eye, <laughs> courtesy of my husband, Dr. Victor Lopez, because you know it's in the elderly that we have eyelid changes. 
this is a natural, sometimes happens, your eyelids sag, there's laxity of the eyelids, exposing more sclera than should be. This should be up here. So what happens, sometimes your tears overflow or your, your, your sclera is actually exposed. Then this is a bad, well, this is a sad um, sequelae of a uh, eyelid plastic surgery when they took off too much skin mm -hmm. and this is also exposed. And when these people close their eyes sometimes, their eyes don't close totally. And of course, this is thyroid disease. Now, if you do not address these problems and you just keep giving eye drops, of course your dry eye will not go away because you have other problems to check. This is also more common as people get older, okay? Except for the thyroid disease, which can also happen in the younger population. So how do we treat dry eye disease? So we've already established that there's dry eye. We know the type. Again, there are steps one, two, three, four, depending on the severity and the type. The treatment goal is to break the vicious cycle of dry eye. Things that I want to say about treatment. There are many established treatment modalities backed up by extensive evidence, level one studies, meaning prospective, randomized, double blind studies. Examples are tear supplements, the drops for dry eye and anti-inflammatory drops. But there are so many treatment modalities that have level two and level three studies shown to relieve signs and symptoms of dry eye disease, but still lacking so many information, so much information and established protocols. But we use them anyway because they work. Example, autologous serum, which we make from the serum of the patient, essential fatty acids like omega-3 fatty acids. We still don't know what is the proper dose. Um, um, to use? What is toxic? What is the proportion of omega-3, omega-6? There's still no established protocol, but we still recommend them. Warm compress, how hot should it be? How long? It says now it should be at least 40 degrees centigrade for it to really take effect, but it's hard to keep the thing warm all the time. So is it five minutes? Is it 10 minutes? So, but these things work. So these are, these are research, um, we still need research and they're very fertile for research. So calling the ophthalmologists there who want to do research, a lot of research potential. There are more research being done and still needs to be done to better understand how and why various treatments of dry eye work and why some don't. Chinese herbs, breast milk, acupuncture. Finally, treatment of dry eye disease is very much an art as it is a science. People respond differently, even to established treatment. We call it hiyang. You expect this to work, but the patient says, no doctor, it makes you feel worse. Hindi hiyang sa akin. That's a Filipino term. And often patience is necessary because many dry eye regimens take at least a month to three months to take effect. Some, like cyclosporins, take about six months to really take effect. So patience is necessary for the patient and for the doctor. So we go in steps. Although this is not... Uh, this is fluid. You may not even start if the patient really has severe dry eyes. But this is a typical patient. It's not so bad yet. You can start by educating the conditions. No? Modify the environment. Too much air con heating the eye. The computer monitor is too high. It should be lower. Educate regarding diet. Maybe include more essential fatty acid supplements or food. And then drink more water. Identify potential modification of offending systemic and topical medicines, remove what can be removed. Of course, lubricants and lid hygiene. There are so many lubricants in the market. Many of them are available over the counter. And these are the usual active ingredients. If you think the, uh, the patient has a lipid, defect, uh, lipid deficiency, then you can give them lipid containing eye drops. Step two, if step one doesn't work, you can continue that and add on. No? You can give non-preserved lubricants, conserved tears by punctal plugs, overnight gels, heat the uh, eyelids in the office to achieve the, the temperature you want, and express the meibomian glands yourself. Now, then you can prescribe antibiotics, antibiotic steroid ointments, oral antibiotics, and then steroid drops for a limited time, then other immunomodulator drugs that are not steroids, like cyclosporine and tacrolimus, even oral azithromycin, tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline. This is a patient of mine who came with severe um, evaporative dry eye, and I used to do this for him weekly, and he improved a lot. No? Um, it really helps to do this. This is, um, meibomian secretions are like oil, but when they're so severe, it's like toothpaste. No? And you know that there's something really wrong. Punctal plugs, and these are the, this decos, the cofasol, actually stimulates the 
epithelial cells of the eye of the conjunctiva and the goblet cells to secrete mucin and more fluid. And these ones are the non-steroidal immunomodulators. Step three, if this, uh, those interventions don't work, you can use serum eye drops. They promote epithelial healing. They neutralize inflammation and they're rich in so many factors. Then soft contact lenses or rigid scleral lenses. And if the interventions of step three are still inadequate, you may need to do surgery, okay? And of course, address lid abnormalities early on. The treatment is just a guide. It is, not, it is fluid, not rigid. A lot depends on the severity of the case upon presentation. This case, for example, he has severe, he has so much inflammation. I won't go to step one. I'll go that with the steroids, the lid scrubs. I gave them oral medication already. So it all depends on how the patient presents. It is not written in stone. There's more research going on on all of this, androgen-containing eye drops, breast milk because of lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is in breast milk. It's also in the tears. It is anti-inflammatory, antibacterial. Chinese herbal medicines, we still need to research, but it is shown to work. Acupuncture has been shown to increase tears and reduce symptoms. Diet, our favorite coffee supposedly helps uh, increase tears and dry eye. And then uh, essential fatty acids, manuka honey also. But we still don't have standardized um, treatments or doses for all of these. But research is going on, and we need more research. In summary, dry eye disease is among the most common conditions in the general population. It's more prevalent in those 50 years old and above, and more in women. It is multifactorial. It's caused by many things, but these things it's linked to disruption in the homeostasis or in the balance. Treatment of dry eye depends on the type and severity. A simple hit and miss may be ineffective and may just cause frustration, especially when a dry eye is moderate to severe already. Not all eye drops are the same. The aim is to break the vicious cycle. The correct way to use eye drops is not to wait for the pain, but to preempt it. That's what we tell our patients. And don't take dry eye seriously or lightly. It may signal other eye problems or systemic problems. We have a multitude of treatments, treatment modalities for dry eye disease, although we need to research more. The more we know, the more we don't know. It's an exciting time for dry eye uh, diseases and dry eye students like myself. If you think you have dry eye disease and your symptoms do not improve even with your lubricants, please see your ophthalmologist. Don't let dry eye keep you from enjoying life to the fullest, especially in your senior years. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Padilla, for that very comprehensive talk. Uh, I would like to call on Dr. Eleanor Iguban from UP College of Medicine, Batch 2009, also from the New Sigma Fisiorarity, to give us a reaction on the talk. So good noon, everyone, and uh, to everyone who's watching. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Rapadilla, for that very, very comprehensive and complete report. Thank you also to the New Sigma Fisiorology for inviting us to share our knowledge with you. So um, since that was really a comprehensive <laughs> report already, thank you for making my job as a reactor easier. Okay, So as a reactor, I would like uh, to share just a couple of tips to prevent dry eye. So as you know, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Okay. So prevent dry eye, please do not forget to blink. Okay. So I, I made that acronym so that it will be easier for you to remember. So blink. And then B is to take regular breaks from visual work. Visual work meaning games or <laughs> computers or even just reading. So take at least 20 second break for every 20 minutes of visual work by staring 20 feet away or by just closing your eyes and take frequent blinks. Okay. Next L is to lubricate your eyes. So there are many over-the-counter lubricant drops. However, make sure that um, you first consult your ophthalmologist with regards to your dry eye symptoms. Um, since not the treatment for dry eye is actually individualized and, accord, and like what Dr. Mengita said earlier, hiyang hiyang yan. So, so one drop may not work for one patient, the other one drop may work for another patient. Okay. Next is to increase your intake of water or make sure that you hydrate yourself. So what we know is that usually we are, we should be taking in around six 
to eight glasses of water a day, um, especially for those without um, those with no limitations for oral intake. Okay, of course, for kidney patients, you might have to limit your water. Okay, and it's for nourishment. So please, uh, you can modify uh, your dietary intake. Besides eating a healthy, balanced diet, make sure you eat, uh, take in uh, foods rich in omega fatty acids. So that includes your fish, your nuts, your legumes, your fruits, okay, eggs. Okay. Another C is for cleaning your lids. Okay. So as Dr. Padilla mentioned earlier, lids can harbor a lot of organ parasites. It can be a cause of inflammation, and inflammation can also trigger dry eye especially the evaporative diet. So make sure that you clean your lids. If you put on eye makeup, make sure to remove it every night because the debris can cause infections and inflammations and later on dry eye, okay? How to clean your lids? Um, this will be, you could consult your ophthalmologist on the best way to how to clean your lids. Mm -hmm. And then next is to uh, have an appropriate environmental condition. So avoid facing uh, the fan head on so that if this increases your dry eye symptoms, also cold and dry environments, so especially those working in air conditioned rooms may need to put on ocular lubricants to prevent dry eye, okay? So as a take home message, So perhaps our eyes need to be washed by our tears once a while mm -hmm. so that we can see life with a clearer view again. So please don't make dry eye a hindrance to seeing life clearer, uh, especially in your aging years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, Dr. Iguban. We now have 550 participants registered for this webinar, 76 viewing through UP Manila live stream, 32 through YouTube, and 141 through Facebook Live um, as group views. And we also have um, around seven groups uh, watching us, um, to mention HealthServe, Los Baños Medical Center, Beacon Eye Center, Flores Memorial Medical Center, UP Manila School, of, School for Health Sciences, Palo Leite, Later. And Makati Medical Center. Yes. Makati Medical Center Imagine. supporting me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have um, many friends there. <laughs> the floor is now open for questions from the audience. I have a question here mm -hmm. from Kathy Haynes on Facebook Live. Is dry eye syndrome caused by prolonged use of computer? Is it reversible? Yes, um, as I mentioned earlier, habits um, can bring about dry eye. No? You know, when you're using the computer for a long time, um, studies have shown that people don't have complete blinks. And it's not before they thought, it's that when you're so engrossed with the computer, you don't blink as many times. No, they blink the same, but they do not blink completely. And that can cause dry eye syndrome. In fact, as uh, Noor uh, mentioned, 20, 20, 20. If you use the computer for more than 20 minutes, every 20 minutes, take a 20 second break, look away at an image far away, or you can even close your eyes. Don't forget to blink because it can. It is reversible because if it's because of habit, all you have to do is change the habit. One of the things we tell our patients is examine your workstation, your work area. If, you're, if your video display monitor is level or above your head, that's wrong. It should be a little below. Because if it's a level or above, you end up drying your eyes more. So you have to fix that. Is the aircon hitting your face directly? Is an electric fan hitting your face directly? If the answer is yes, change your position. So yes, it is reversible. And it's very common um, because of our technology. Many young people now have dry eye disease. And it's because of the environment. It's because of computer use and poor working habits and poor ergonomics. So yes, it's reversible, but please see your ophthalmologist. They may give you some drops also to use. Okay. Yes, and not just computers, also oh, yeah. gadgets. Everything, all gadgets. Cell phones. Yeah, cell phones, laptops. Uh, and they, they've also, um, there's also studies that show the smaller the gadget, the worse it is because you don't, your, your, your incomplete link is even worse in the mm -hmm. smaller gadgets. Like, it, I mean, I tried to watch uh, Netflix on my cell phone <laughs> and I really got headaches. You know? And uh, because 
you know, you're trying so hard to, to look at a small object. Another thing is playing games. Yes. Sometimes candy the games. <laughs> and not only the Candy Crush, it's actually the fast uh, games. Yes. The, because you see, they feel if they close their eyes too long, they can't win or they yes, can't see. And I, I really had patients who had severe dry eyes mm -hmm. symptoms because of playing all these games. So yes, it can lead to dry eye disease. Yeah. In connection to that, also it's, um, before the dry eye was more prevalent in the aging population. Yes. And because the younger population now are more into uh, digital uh, media, uh, more on computers and on iPad gadgets. We're seeing also more and more dry eye in the kids. Yes. In the teenagers. Yeah. Correct. So it spans a different age group already. <laughs> It's a disease of technology yes. also, yes. And in computer vision syndrome, dry eye is one of the more prevalent components of computer vision syndrome. Yeah. And you mentioned computer vision syndrome. Maybe we can describe yeah, what you can, com computer you, you want, you want to is. describe, you want me to describe yeah. it? Well, it, it's, it encompasses a lot of things now because of the use of uh, gadgets. No? Sometimes even the wrist no? from the use of the uh, mouse, yeah, okay? yeah. it can do that. Your back sometimes hurts. The your neck. neck sometimes hurts yeah. because of the computer. So, it, 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 it's a, your whole body can be affected by computer vision syndrome. But the most the most prevalent is really the eyes. Right. Yeah. It, when you read a book, you're looking at printed word on paper. It's still. Yes. When you look at the computer, you're looking at pixels which are forever moving. Mm -hmm. So the strain is also worse when you're using the computer. That's why your eyes are always adjusting. I had a patient who came because he, his his pupils had became uh, paralyzed oh. because of the computer. He was <laughs> playing games for a long, long time. He was a father. He was not a child. He was an <laughs> older man whose children were alarmed and they thought he had a brain tumor mm -hmm. because his pupils were dilated. But uh, he was just, it was just fatigue from prolonged games in the computer. I should report that. I've yeah, never, yeah, I only yeah, saw yeah. it once in my so, life. He ended up in the emergency report. room of St. Luke's Medical Center. <laughs> they thought he had a brain tumor. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it can really cause a lot of problems. Okay. So we have another question here. What is the difference between eye drops and ointments? And which one do you prefer? Uh, <laughs> for well, infection? For infection or for dry eye? Yes. Oh, no, okay. Eye drops, okay versus eye gels or ointments because if you're talking about ointments it's different from eye gels maybe we can talk about the different yes. vehicles because in a no in in eye drops it's more liquid it's yes. less viscous okay now the problem is some people need longer lasting eye um, medicine especially when they sleep at night for example and you have patients who sleep with their eyes a little open, open. Yes. we tell them to put eye gels in the evening because that whole that way their whole night they have something to protect their eyes but it's not very practical to be using eye gels during the day because it can blur your vision mm -hmm. hence some products have been uh, developed that are longer lasting than regular eye drops but they don't blur the vision as much the more viscous the eye drop for dry eye, the more the likelihood it will blur your vision, although it lasts longer, okay? Ointments, on the other hand, are more oily vehicles, and we have those usually to treat infections and inflammations of the eyelid. We use them for scrubbing the eyelids, no? But the gels for dry eye are gels. They're not really called ointments, no? Mm -hmm. They're gels, no? And uh, again, those are the differences. When you have severe dry eye, sometimes drops are not enough. Then you will be given eye gels. Okay, and so it depends on your doctor to decide what is best for you. And also it depends on you, you know, if you feel more comfortable with the eye drops alone. But if you find yourself using it so often already, and it's not relieved, yeah. then you may need the eye gels, thicker ones. Okay, okay so that was a good uh, question actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now we have another one. How about in hot temperatures by demographic location like Tugigarao? Is Sometimes it, if it's very hot, yes, it can cause also dryness. But the nice thing about the Philippines, it's humid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not as bad as the hot and dry. Okay. But if it's extremely hot, yes, your eyes actually get painful because it can evaporate. No. But again, if it's hot and humid, it's not as bad as hot and dry, like in the desert. Yeah. We have many patients from. And that's why I'm mean, going back first to the question: If you're going to a hot environment, do please bring ba on. You know, bring eye drops with you. And maybe use sunglasses, no, and don't don't stay out in the very, very hot sun if you can avoid it. It's also bad for the skin. Mm -hmm. Going back to the desert, I have patients who were 
OFWs, engineers, and they were they were subjected to all these harsh um, climates, especially sandstorms. Mm -hmm. Then they came home with severe, severe blepharitis, they booming gland dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Terrible. So that's also a risk factor. And I'm still, they're chronically having to undergo treatment for their um, eyelid problems. Okay, before we continue, we would like to thank uh, or acknowledge Sanpen, today's sponsor oh, of the webinar. Thank you. Another question here from an ophthalmologist from Jan in Catalonia. Oh, <laughs> when should expressing of meibomian glands be performed? How frequent should it be done and how should it be done? And oh. what should be the end point? I mean, okay. you can't go you see? on. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> I have patients now. You know, as I said, in dry eye, there's no gold standard. Mm -hmm. There is no gold standard. They won't tell you, oh, you do it every week or you do it every month. Some say once a month is enough. Um, the end point is when the patient is no longer symptomatic. When they feel, my patients tell me, oh, I feel so much better. It's like I feel my eyes have been shampooed. No? Um, how often do you do it? If it's really severe, you can do it every week. If mm -hmm. it's not so bad, every month they say is enough. No? Um, and you have to tell your patient, just because I expressed your meibomian and glad today doesn't mean it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. Then you treat. When you tell the patients to do it, you tell them first do the warm compress yes. because the warm yes. compress will soften the, the plugs. Do the warm compress from five to 10 minutes, again, depending on the studies. Again, there's no gold standard, but the warm compress we know softens the, the plugs. After the that's softened, you of course should tell your patients massage, but nothing can be as good as you doing it yourself in the clinic. So you can then do the expression. There are many ways to do it. I like just using putting anesthetic and using uh, two firm Q-tips. There are many gadgets for this, but some are very painful. You know? I express it. I tell the patient this is uncomfortable. It will make you feel better. After doing this regularly, you will see eventually they come to you. There aren't that many plugs anymore. But that's not the only thing you're going to do, Jan. You're going to have to give them the medicine. Sometimes you have to give them oral. I mentioned earlier acetromycin macrolides. Before, we used to always give tetracyclines, minocyclines, doxycycline. 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 That's fine. Yes. But because they attack the lipases, right? they prevent the breakdown mm -hmm. of, they prevent the inflammation. However, acetromycin now, I'm kind of using yeah, it again. Course. Yes, because acetromycin also increases meibomian gland secretion. It has a way of increasing the meibomian gland, aside from the inflammation and the bacteria. So um, there are, again, many suggested ways to do it, but I'm sort of starting with one tablet three times a day. I have one tablet once a day for three days, then repeat the cycle two more times every seven days. So it's like 21 okay. days. Now, that's, that's only based on research, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so, Jan, you express it until the time comes, but you know, you'll be surprised. The patients will look for it. If you're doing it properly, they'll feel better. Then they come back. I have a patient, he's a very high executive, always traveling. When he shows up, I need you to express my, my bombing glass, he tells me, <laughs> because he feels better after I do. So, that's again, there's no hard and fast rule about endpoint. The endpoint is you've cleaned all the glands in the clinic. You treat the patient, patient feels better. Eventually, you will, will, you will not need to do it anymore. I find that. Uh, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if it's really still there, I just keep doing it every month. No? Um, okay. okay. Yes. So thank you for that question. And now we have another question. Are people taking estrogen therapy or using contraceptives prone to dry yes. eye disease? Yes, they are. Um, I said earlier that estrogens and progesterones can actually inhibit the production of meibomian, of, of lipids yes. in the meibomian glands. That's why um, it can actually cause um, worse than dry eye disease. No? Um, that's why you have, it's, this is also towards uh, the obstetricians and gynecologists mm -hmm. because they may see that in some of their patients who are on estrogen or birth uh, or contraceptives yes. and have estrogens and progesterones, they complain of dry eye disease. So refer them to the ophthalmologist mm -hmm. because it's not imagined, it is real. No, they also for patients with breast cancers yes. that are on hormone therapy. Yes. Yeah, they also come to proper yeah. clinics for dry eye symptoms. Yes. yes. It's a balance. It. It's yeah. always balance. I, I cannot overemphasize the word balance, homeostasis, equilibrium, as far as dry eye and tear function is concerned. Yeah. You have to restore the balance. No? Oh, another thing, sometimes they, they say androgens not protect the eye against dryness. 
But sometimes when women are taking hormonal replacement, there's a destruction of the demoment glands because of too much estrogens and progesterones. What happens? The body signals to the brain and to the other organs to produce more testosterone man. Mm -hmm. So you, sometimes there's a paradoxical increase in testosterone to respond to the damage by bovine glands. Again, the body is trying to achieve balance, mm -hmm. to restore its balance. The body tries it to restore balance. No? You, uh, I, okay. <laughs> okay, now next question. <laughs> After LASIK surgery, oh, yeah. my eyes have always been dry. Is there any alternative to artificial eye drops? So or can, artificial tears that I can use. You can answer well, that. We, That's your yeah, we resort to surgery. Sometimes uh, we uh, the supplements, yes. omega three fatty acids, mm -hmm. uh, like a, a, a thousand milligrams a day. Some say a thousand, some say three thousand. But even if you see three thousand, how much of that is really active? Only yeah, a small percentage. Small. Again, as I said, there's no gold standard yet, but mm -hmm. it helps. Mm -hmm. What about punctal plugs? Do you use we, punctal plugs? We, we put punctal, yes, punctal uh, plugs to uh, on patients high risk for dry, dry eyes, eyes, and yeah. also even after the procedure, mm -hmm. usually those with moderate to severe. Yes. Yes. yes, and um, and I'm asking questions because uh, these are questions that people yeah, who are yeah. thinking of refractive mm -hmm. surgery will ask. Mm -hmm. it. Is a dry eye now an absolute contraindication? Because I know you screen for dry eye you disease. For no? dry eyes. And when will you say it's okay, we can treat you, and then you cannot have it? No? Okay. Um, it's not an absolute contraindication, yes. but we there's there are some patients that we have to pre-treat, like maybe maybe sometimes months yeah. on you know lubricants, uh, anti-inflammatory drops before we before you do, do the LASIK. Okay. Because we end up with a more yeah. uh, so after LASIK it becomes more severe. Severe, yes. Yeah. Better to treat it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, what happens in LASIK is you could transect the nerves. <coughs> so yeah. dry eye really happens. But it's not supposed to be permanent, no? Correct. It's it eventually it goes away. It's maybe just uh, two to three months. Yeah. At most six, six months. months. Yes. yes. But I don't know if this is the one who asked the question, how long has it been going on? Because if it's been going on for a long time, maybe there are other factors to yes, consider. Maybe it's not we always that. ask if they're yeah. on the computer a lot, yes. they use their gadgets. Mm -hmm. Yes, or maybe some medicines they're taking mm -hmm. are also adding to the dryer or their diet. So it's multifactorial. Again, yes. it may not just be the lazy. This is yeah. why dry eye is really very difficult to treat because yes. there are a lot of factors mm -hmm. to be considered. It's mm -hmm. just not surgery, but just your age. It's mm -hmm. a multitude of factors. Yes, yeah. multifactorial. Yes. <laughs> okay, now next. How about contact lens and dry eyes? Mm. Is there a correlation? Yes, there is. Um, as I said in my lecture, contact lenses in themselves or chronic contact lens wear can damage the goblet cells mm -hmm. and the conjunctival cells. And goblet cells and conjunctival cells produce mucin and also aqueous. No? Mm -hmm. um, the irony of it is that Contact lenses can also be used to treat dry eye, okay? Especially if there's a lot of filaments, if you want to preserve um, aqueous, no? Mm -hmm. So, but yes, contact lenses are a risk factor for dry eye, especially ill-fitting contact lenses, yes. especially abuse of the contact lenses, especially if you, you're always not sleeping, puyat. <laughs> you stay up late, no? And you don't sleep and you're wearing your contact lenses. Uh, there's so many factors, or else, or if you have vitamin A deficiency also, and you're wearing contact lenses, yes, it can be a factor. Yes. Okay. Another question is: Is dry eye disease found in children? Okay, it can be. We have patients. I have patients, but it's usually secondary to something else. Mm -hmm. no? The very common one, severe ones, are atopic keratoconjunctivitis, meaning atopy, meaning allergies. allergies I had a six-year-old child who was a patient who was coming in for scarring of the scarring of the corneas, severe scarring dry eye, already scarring of the corneas, severe dry eye. Mm -hmm. They wanted to do a transplant. Mm -hmm. Her vision was 2200. I said, wait, if we do a transplant now, we'll just reject. Yes, yes, we yes. did all the tests and I figured out, we realized it was a a topic or an, a severe allergic condition that resulted also in mm -hmm. a dry mm -hmm. eye. Okay, we had to give her tacrolimus because okay, you can give her now the uh, anti-inflammatories, but she was also reacting to steroids. Her mm -hmm. pressure would mm -hmm. go up. And then I gave her tacrolimus, <clears throat> which which is an immune modulator, yes. which is non steroidal. Do you know her vision went from twenty two hundred to twenty fifty wow. because even the scar and the and the vascularization went down her dry eye improved and she's in her uh, she's being maintained on a um, lipid containing mm -hmm. 
non-preservative drop plus tacrolimus. And her, you have to refer to a immunologist yes. because another thing about dry eye, if it's because of other factors, you have to be working with pediatricians, with immunologists. It's a holistic mm -hmm. approach, yeah. no? Because there are sometimes, sometimes it's because of something else. No? Yes, it can happen in children, but usually, if the child is always on the computer, also, yeah. then you have the one from the computer, but you can just modify behavior. Mm -hmm. okay. It's more prevalent now that kids are more yes. really exposed to that. Correct, and, correct. Uh, multimedia. Mm, multimedia, yeah. Okay, we have a question here. I <laughs> mean, questions. Uh -huh. Vicin and IMO, do they have role? Do okay. they have a role in the treatment of dry okay. eyes? Um, I okay. If it's the these drops no, with decongestants mm -hmm. that cause the redness to go away, they can ins it, they can actually cause dry eye. Okay, now if you have the the drops over the counter that supposedly for dry eye, not for red eyes, but their preservatives the man are very strong, yes. like benzalkonium chloride, they can also cause dry eye. So what I tell my patients, if you're using these OTC eye drops and it's, it's helping you for a while, but if you abuse it, your eyes are always red, then you put it just to make it go away, then it gets red again. You mm -hmm. have to see your ophthalmologist mm -hmm. because you might be making things worse. Yes. The decongestants in themselves, if it's for red eyes, can cause dry eye, can worsen it, and the preservatives can also cause dry eye. Mm -hmm. But if you're using it once in a while, you want to look pretty for a tutorial, <laughs> or you were irritated, <laughs> you want to look pretty webinar. for a webinar, okay? <laughs> it's okay. But if you find yourself using and using, being dependent on it, you may have, you probably have a problem, okay? So they have that kind of a role, okay? Okay, so do we have other questions coming in? No okay. more? Okay, um, so um, thank you all for the questions that you sent. And once again, thank you, Dr. Mingita Padilla and Dr. Eleanor Iguban for enlightening us with your answers. So in summary, we learned a lot from Dr. Padilla and also Dr. Iguban. Uh, not all dry eyes are treated with uh, lubricants only, and uh, dry eye is a very debilitating disease for the elderly population, and the uh, proper diagnosis mm -hmm. is needed to, uh, to try to pinpoint the cause to be able to treat, it, uh, treat the dry eye syndrome in a patient. So the Museum of Sorority would like to thank again our esteemed speaker, Dr. Mingita Padilla, and our reactor, Dr. Eleanor Inguban, for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. We also thank our partners, the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. We are also grateful to support to the support from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine. UP Manila Information Management Service, and DOST, ASTI, and the PRC Board of Nursing. Most of all, we thank you, our participants, for spending your lunch hour with us. To receive your certificates of attendance, kindly answer the evaluation form at bit.ly slash eval, E-V-A-L, 020819 within two days to receive your certificate of attendance emailed to your registered email addresses. The, <clears throat> here is a quick view of the schedule of our upcoming webinars. For the first quarter, we have three more. Uh, for, we have one more, three more webinars or two more? Oh, three three more. more. Aging and longevity among healthcare professionals, diabetes mellitus and the kidneys in the elderly, and hypertension in the elderly. For the second quarter, we have five, we have six webinars on menopause, asthma and COPD, osteoporosis, arthritis, sexual dysfunction, and post-operative cognitive dysfunction. For the third quarter, we have another six webinars on vaccination, asthma and COPD, hearing loss, head and neck cancer, aging kidneys, and lung cancer. Finally, the fourth quarter has five webinars on aging skin. Wow, we want to listen to that. <laughs> no, <not even>. uh, <laughs> and pneumonia, diabetes, and thyroid disorders, and mental health issues, and Parkinson's disease. For more details and updates, please check our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash 
aging webinars and uh, also tune in to our Twitter um, account, Aging Webinars. Today's webinar recordings and all webinar recordings may be viewed at YouTube at Aging Webinars. Please join us again on February 22, 2019, 12 noon for the webinar on diabetes mellitus and the kidneys by Dr. Agnes Mejia. We are also announcing the launch of the OB Pearls book um, by the Music of his sorority. So get your copies now. And we also would like to invite you then to attend the UP Med, UP Med webinars every Wednesdays. And this February 13, it would be uh, Dr. Deborah David Ona on uh, updates on hypertension. This is Dr. Alnet Tan, together with Dr. Mungita Padilla and Dr. Eleanor Iguban, closing this webinar. And once again, special thanks to Santen, our sponsor for today. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>